Hey, thank you very much, everyone. Um, my Twitter handle is jtauber, if you want to follow me there. Uh, so I'm going to be talking about a, a project that I've been working on for a while, uh, Apple Pi, uh, an emulator of the Apple II in Python. Uh, in light of the talk that's going to be given after this, uh, this talk could be titled Episode 4, A New uh, 6502. Um, <laughs> the reason for that will become clear if, uh, in the next talk. Uh, but just going back sort of historically, uh, even though I had uh, computers prior to the Apple II, uh, the Apple II was really the one I sunk my teeth into. This is a picture of, I didn't have an actual Apple II, I had a clone of an Apple II in the, uh, in the early 80s. That was all the, uh, the, the thing. Um, uh, and um, so this was a, a, a Microtech um, computer when I was about uh, 10 years old. You can see the five and a quarter floppy drive and the dot matrix printer and all that, so the joystick, that sort of fun stuff. But just going back, give a bit of history about the Apple II. The first Apple II came out in 1977. Uh, the CPU was a 6502 running at one megahertz. It uh, came with integer basic, so there was no uh, floating point operations at all in the basic. Uh, it came standard with 4K RAM, but uh, you could get up to uh, 48K um, if you paid a little bit extra. <laughs> in 79, uh, the Apple II Plus came out. It came with 48K standard. Um, and it came with AppleSoft Basic from Microsoft, which included floating point operations. And then in 1983, the Apple IIe came out. It had 64K RAM standard, and it included, for the first time, lowercase letters. Now, the original Apple II had a number of, of innovations. It, it really was very innovative from a hardware point of view. There were innovations in the way the display was done, the way sound was done, the way the disk drive was done. Just to give you a couple of examples, um, the 6502 CPU only reads memory every other cycle, uh, which meant that something like the display uh, hardware could read uh, the main RAM uh, the, the other cycle. So there was no need for a separate uh, video RAM and Steve Wozniak made use of that fact. To, he was keen on reducing the number of, of chips, so he uh, just used the standard uh, RAM for uh, video. Another example, um, disk drives at the time uh, had, you know, were fairly advanced in, in what you could uh, tell them to do. There was a, a signal you could send them to uh, go to track zero. But Steve Wozniak worked out he could reduce the number of chips necessary if, in, if he just removed that functionality. And instead of having a command to go to track zero, he just figured, well, the disk has 35 tracks on average. So if I just move the head 40 in, um, then we're guaranteed of eventually hitting track zero. And uh, did I just lose audio then? Oh, that's still there. Uh, and that's why when you start up an Apple II, it made that thunk, 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 thunk noise. That's actually the, dr the uh, head of the drive hitting uh, a, um, a rubber stopper. Um, but that sort of sums up Steve Wozniak's whole approach. Uh, why implement in hardware what you can do in software? And that made things really difficult for me, trying to build an emulator. Uh, so in terms of Apple Pie, I actually started this project back in 2001. Um, it was up in SourceForge at the time. Uh, and I implemented a decent amount of the CPU, uh, got the ROM booting up until a particular point, but it, it, you could see the integer basic prompt, but uh, if you typed in commands it would error, and I never really worked out exactly what the problem was. It's extremely difficult to debug an emulation of a, of a CPU. Um, I didn't touch it for a while in February 2007. I thought I'd give it another go. I put it on Google Code, as that was all the rage then. Did a massive refactor of the 6502 code, but didn't really get much further in terms of functionality. And then in 2011, um, I decided to get back to it again, put it on GitHub, uh, tweeted it, and within hours had patches. Um, and this, this really says something, I think, about how much open source has changed. In 10 years, I didn't get a single other person interested in helping out, contributing at all. Put it on GitHub, send out a tweet, and already I'm getting contributors within hours. Um, so Greg uh, Hugel was the, the person that uh, sent the first bunch of patches, and I worked with him um, on a bunch of stuff. I finished off the, the CPU support, added low and high res graphics and sound, and worked with Greg on the cassette and, and other things. So if we take a step back and think about how emulation works, imagine that you had some computer game written in BASIC that you wanted to uh, that you want to play. One thing you could do is uh, trick the user into thinking they're playing the original game um, just by it having exactly the same 
input output properties, right? You could just you could rewrite the, the program and as long as it looked and felt like the original, you could trick the user. But imagine that you wanted to actually use the original program written in BASIC. Well, in order to do that, you would have to fake the basic interpreter. You'd write your own basic interpreter and then you could actually use the original uh, source code of the game. But say you wanted to reuse the actual basic interpreter that the Apple II came, well, then you'd need to fake the lower level ROM routines. Um, but if you actually wanted to use a real Apple II ROM, you'd have to fake the 6502. And, and you can keep going. You can imagine uh, you know, actually taking the real logic gate layout of the 6502 and, and plugging that into simulated logic gates or even going further down to, to transistors. This actually does get done. Transistor level simulation is actually how uh, companies like Intel and AMD actually do their chip testing. A guy from Intel told me a, a couple of weeks ago that they actually you know, boot Windows up in a transistor level simulation of their, of their CPUs. Um, just in the, 605, uh, the 6502 space, there are actually transistor level simulations of the 6502. There's something called Visual 6502. Um, which you can go to, and it's, it's actually in JavaScript doing a transistor level simulation. That's not what I'm doing. I'm faking the 6502 and the, uh, the input output, but everything else above is real. So as far as you imagine the Apple II ROM thinks it's running on a real Apple II, um, your basic programs think they're running on a real Apple II. So to give a, get a bit of an in overview of uh, the 6502 itself, because that's really at the core of implementing this emulator, the 6502 had 3,500 uh, transistors. So just to put that into perspective, this laptop here has on the order of a billion. Um, just 3,500 transistors in the 6502. Uh, data was 8-bit, so you were essentially just manipulating numbers from 0 to 255. Uh, you could sign them as well. Uh, addresses were 16-bit, so you could address up to uh, 64K of RAM without doing any kind of bank switching. You had three general and three special purpose registers. So you know, we're all spoilt in this wonderful world of Python where we can have unlimited number of variables and you've got all these wonderful data structures. If you're programming directly for the 6502, you've got three, effectively three variables. They're global and they can only contain the numbers 0 to 255. Um, you, you do have a stack. Um, but it can only go 256 uh, deep, and it can only contain 8-bit numbers. And of course, you do have memory, so you can sort of view that as a, a 65,536 uh, item array, but it's global, and it can only contain 8-bit numbers. Uh, the three general uh, registers include the accumulator and two index registers. We'll see in a moment why they're called index registers, if you're not familiar with them. The special purpose registers include um, the status register, the stack pointer to record where in the stack you are, and uh, something called the program counter, which is the only 16-bit register. Um, the, the program counter tells you where in memory you're currently executing code from. And then on top of this, there's about 60 commands. Uh, mostly to do with just transferring things between accumulators or, or uh, back and forth from memory, maybe doing some logic manipulation um, and so on. And that's really it. The 6502 didn't have multiplication or division. The most it could do uh, math-wise is, is uh, adding and subtracting. So how might we go about implementing something like this? Well, the obvious way is to start off with a class like CPU and it can have some attributes on it, like the accumulator and the X index. Uh, and that's exactly what, what, uh, what Apple Pie uh, does. And then we'll set up uh, the various operations, the various commands that can get run, basically putting them in an array, uh, a list of uh, 256 uh, slots in it that basically map the opcode, um, like 8A in hex, uh, maps to a particular command, in this case uh, something called TXA, which transfers whatever the value of the X index is into the accumulator, and, um, and that's going to be a method somewhere else on our CPU. And that's pretty much the pattern that it follows. Then all we need is a run method. What that does is it basically uh, looks at the program counter, reads a byte, uh, looks up that opcode in our self.ops 
list that we uh, created in the previous slide and just execute that. The get PC is just a, a helper method that uh, gets the program counter and increments it by one and then returns the original value. So this is actually kind of like the Python VM. Uh, the Python VM has a very similar loop that's just basically looping over uh, opcodes and deciding what to do based on, on those, uh, those opcodes. And there was a very similar slide to this. If any of you saw um, Alex Gaynor's talk on how to write an interpreter, he actually had a slide that was very similar to this, looping over uh, based on a program counter and, uh, and then executing. So what does TXA itself look like? Um, this is a slight simplification. You'll see the real one in a, in a moment. But the basic idea is you set the accumulator to, uh, to the value of the X index. Now, it's a little bit more complicated than that because uh, there are some operations that change the status register. The, fl the, the status register is a, an 8-bit register, but it can really be thought of as a set of, of Boolean flags. Uh, there's a carry flag, a zero flag, an overflow flag, and a sign flag. And these get changed after certain operations to indicate that we just got a zero or we just got a negative number. Uh, and so the real way that TXA works is instead of just passing the uh, X index into the accumulator, we run it through this update NZ, uh, which makes sure it's in the range um, of, of 0 to 255, uh, and you'll see why that's important in a moment, and then do these tests of if it was 0, set the 0 flag. If it was uh, negative, in other words, the high bit was set, we'll set the sign flag. And that's really the essence of how the, the 6502 is, is implemented. Just a couple of other commands to show you. Uh, dex and, and inks is a decrement the x index and increment the, the uh, x index. And you can see how they're implemented below. This is where that uh, modulo uh, 256 is important because increment and decrement wrap round if you uh, go outside the bounds of, of one byte. So far, the operations we've seen have all just manipulated things. They haven't had any arguments at all. Um, the way that uh, arguments work in uh, 6502 and, and many uh, CPUs is you have this notion of addressing modes, which uh, are really different ways of getting the, the uh, operand that you need for your particular operation. So just to give uh, a, a quick overview of some of these, the first one, by the way, the dollar sign is what uh, people used to use to indicate that something was in hex. Uh, in this world anyway, unlike the sort of 0x that you see in the C world, in, in this world it was the dollar sign. So dollar sign just means hex. The, the first one means load the actual number 10 in hex into the accumulator. The second one says load whatever's in the memory location 10 into the accumulator. The third one is uh, load uh, whatever's in memory location 10, 10. The reason they're actually two different addressing modes is the first uh, 256 bytes of memory, uh, the so-called zero page, um, you only need one byte to express the address there. So by giving a separate, uh, it a separate opcode, you can save a byte um, and know that you've only got one byte to read in uh, for the address. The next two, the, the 10 comma x and the 10 10 comma x, this is uh, why the x register is, is sometimes called the x index, because what those say is load, um, load from uh, 10 plus x in memory. x is used as an index into effectively an array starting at 10. And you can do the same with y. The last two are the so-called indirect addressing modes. Um, the second to the bottom, what it basically says is go to 10, 10, add x, and whatever is in the next two bytes from that location, use though that as the location to get the value you want to put into the accumulator. Uh, the last one's uh, slightly different. It does the indirection before it adds the index register. And that's pretty much it in terms of the addressing modes uh, that uh, are available for LDA anyway. And the way they're implemented, instead of directly putting a, a method reference into our self.ops, uh, what we actually do is we put into self.ops a lambda that first of all calls um, one of these addressing mode uh, methods to resolve what the memory address we really want is and then pass that through to LDA. So just to give you a quick example of how these um, addressing modes work, if it's immediate mode, that's the mode where we're just literally putting in the, the, the number 10. Well, the program counter is pointing to that memory address, so we just grab the program counter and, and pass that through to, to LDA or whatever else is being run. If it's a zero page mode, we read the byte that's at um, whatever the program counter says and put that in the accumulator, um, and, and so on. You'll notice at the bottom, the last one, the indirect mode, 
uh, it, it has this read word bug. Um, the 6502 has bugs. You don't often think, well, those of you who remember the uh, floating point bug in the Pentium will, will know these things happen. But the 6502 had bugs too. And of course, developers using the 6502 knew about these bugs and wrote around them, which means my emulator has to have the bug. Um, and so that's what that's, that's about. The bug had to do with if, uh, if the two bytes that you were trying to load uh, spanned a, a page. Um, instead of reading one byte and the next byte, it would read one byte and the byte uh, wrapped around on the same page at the start. So mine had to do that. And then LDA becomes really simple. Uh, you, you, we're passing in the address to use for the operand, and so we can just read that byte, uh, pass it through the update NZ method to make sure the flags are set correctly, and I put it in the accumulator. There's a couple of other uh, slightly different uh, operations I'll show you. Uh, to finish up the, the sort of CPU section before we get into the trickier stuff, uh, jump is uh, just involves changing the program counter to whatever gets passed in. Uh, JSR is jump to a subroutine, so we need to remember where we were in order to return back to it when we're finished with a subroutine. So in this case, we just there's a there's a helper uh, method push word to just push stuff to the stack. Uh, RTS returns, and it just basically uh, pulls pulls a word off the off the stack and sets the program counter to that. Uh, and that's how these are these implemented. Push byte just writes to the stack and adjusts the stack pointer appropriately. Uh, push word just does that, but with two bytes. And um, pull and pull byte and pull word just work the opposite way. Uh, the only really uh, more complex operation than that is uh, things like the add with carry and subtract uh, with with borrow. I guess it is. Um, so this is what add with carry. I'm not going to go into the details, but this is just this is about as complex as it gets on an individual command. So moving on to uh, memory and and uh, and I/O, um, the way memory worked is you know I mentioned that uh, 48k was what say the Apple II Plus had in terms of RAM. Um, that was available from zero up to BFFF. Uh, from C1000 to, to CFFF was uh, memory mapped I.O., so that's actually how you communicated with peripherals and the keyboard and, and um, the speaker and, and the disk drive and so on. And then D1000 on upwards was the ROM, uh, typically. And these are just implemented, um, I won't even bother showing you, they're just classes that wrap a list of, of bytes in, in Python. Now, it's, it's kind of interesting to get some perspective. The original Apple II ROM, uh, the, the top 2K of it uh, was what was called the monitor. It contained effectively the operating system. It had the, the screen and keyboard I.O. It had a disassembler. It had various memory utilities for copying memory. It had support for multiplication and division because, as I mentioned before, they weren't available in the 6502. All of this in 2K. Um, Steve Wozniak wrote a bytecode uh, emulator for 16-bit operations uh, called Sweet 16. Um, so, you know, Alex Gaynor, eat your heart out. He did, Steve Wozniak did this in 372 bytes. Um, there was a mini assembler that just took up 320 bytes. And then there were 248 bytes of unused floating point routines. Steve Wozniak went down the path of implementing floating point uh, but realised that he wasn't going to get it done in time, so abandoned it, just did integer basic, but the, the core floating point routines are actually still in the ROM. And then integer basic itself is just 5K um, at the bottom. So it's pretty amazing stuff. Um, now, moving on to some of the, the I.O., because this is where a lot of the, the challenges ha happen. I mentioned before that the Apple II didn't have any separate uh, video RAM, it used main RAM. Um, and because of Wozniak's drive to reduce the number of chips um, in the hardware, simplify the hardware, uh, one of the side effects of that is that the scan lines are not sequential in memory. So there's not a, there's not a sequential relationship between what row you're wanting to uh, write to on the screen and where it is in memory. And that leads to uh, what's known as the Venetian blind effect, where if you're loading in, uh, say, an image, 
uh, it doesn't it doesn't uh, come from the top down the bottom. It sort of does a bit there, then 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 there. Um, it sort of gives this Venetian blind effect, which we may be able to see uh, when I get to the demo. But this is actually the first example of, of just to kind of almost force a Tolkien reference in here, what I'm calling the there and back again problem, um, which is that there's so much stuff that a developer on the Apple II has to do, or the, the ROM has to do, um, in order to get around these hardware limitations. And so on the right hand side, you know, this is some code that's in the ROM for calculating what memory address you want to uh, use if you want to, say, write a character on the 10th the row. Um, but of course, uh, I use Pygame to actually do the display, and all I care about is that the character is to be written on the 10th row. So the ROM is doing all this work to convert I want to put a character on the 10th row to what memory address that is. I have to then re basically reverse all that and say, OK, I know the memory address. I need to work out what the hell uh, line of text that is. Uh, so on the left-hand side is an example of the sort of code that I had to write uh, to basically reverse uh, what the ROM was doing. So at this stage, um, basically what I've talked about would let you um, boot. Well, once it implemented the display, you could boot it. You'd see the Apple II banner at the top, but it wasn't in the right font, and we really do uh, want this in the right font. So I tracked down uh, somebody had actually done uh, these uh, characters from the original Apple II, so I manually went through and, and created uh, an array uh, describing all of these characters that I could then create Pygame surfaces out of that I could blit onto the screen. Um, so that's the, the font. What about the keyboard and the initial beep? Well, so the way I mentioned before, this whole uh, mapping, uh, memory-based uh, I.O. So C1000 was the keyboard. C1010 was the keyboard strobe to record that you'd read the key off the keyboard. Um, accessing C030 would toggle the speaker. Uh, C060 would read the cassette. Um, so the keyboard's pretty simple. It's just a case of... Um, in, I've got an event loop in, uh, in Pygame, and when a key is pressed, um, I can pretty much just populate down the bottom. You can see the soft switches dot, uh, KBD that gets set, and, and that's actually, when, when uh, memory location C1000 is, uh, is read, that's actually what's, what's getting read. So the keyboard's pretty simple. The speaker, on the other hand, uh, a little trickier. So imagine, right, Pygame easily lets me, um, you know, play a musical, uh, 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 play a, a tone, say a 440 hertz note for a second or whatever. Um, that's not how the speaker in the Apple II works. The way the speaker in the Apple II works is you just read CO30 to toggle the speaker. And you have to do that 440 times a second manually yourself to get that tone, right? So remember, this, this is what the ROM is, is doing to, to my emulator. It's just going to call CO30 um, and I have to work out from that what frequency it's trying to, tr trying to play. So what I had to do, um, you, you didn't see this in the previous code examples, but I, I went through and everywhere passes around a cycle count. Right? So we, we keep track of how many cycle, CPU cycles everything is taking, so we have this CPU cycle count. And then whenever the speaker is toggled, whenever CO30 is read, um, we note what cycle number it was. So when it's next toggled, we know the time between toggles. And that lets us write just a fragment of a sound wave to a buffer. And then after a certain amount of time, I just play what's in the buffer. And you'll see in the demo that that actually uh, kind of works OK. The cassette, we're just coming to the end of the, um, of the slides, and I'll hopefully have time for, it, for the demo. Uh, the, the cassette's almost the reverse of the speaker. We're actually given a sound wave. And uh, when the soft switch is read, um, the CO60, um, we take the cycle number and work out how far into the, uh, the cassette wave file we are. Um, we keep track of whether we've crossed a zero, whether we've gone sort of, whether the wave's gone above or below, and on the basis of that, um, we, we set the, the soft switch. This works about 10, on 10, about 10 percent of the cassettes that I've tried. There are, there are websites that have wave files of Apple II cassettes. I don't know if that's a problem with the cassette or bug in my code, but that's certainly something I'd like to improve. Uh, before I get onto the demo, one last thing, because this is probably the most bizarre thing of all, uh, the way high-res color works. So Steve Wozniak was really brilliant here. 
in just how much he was able to do with so little. But the way it basically works, each row of 280 pixels is represented by, seven, uh, by 40 bytes. So seven bits of each byte are the pixels, and one bit is the, the palette. And then which color from the palette a particular pixel is simply depends on whether it's an odd or even bit in that byte. Palette one, you get black, green, magenta, or white, depending on whether you've got no pixels, an odd pixel, an even pixel, or both turned on. And um, similarly with palette two, you get blue and orange, which leads to this really weird thing. So th th in the top, if you had this in memory, you'd, you'd actually get the pixels below. Imagine that you wanted to set that bit to magenta. Well, what you would want to do is you would want to change the palette bit and change the bit of the pixel. But because we've changed the palette and now we have two pixels on next to one another, you actually get that bottom white and green, not the magenta and orange that you wanted. But of course, this is how the Apple II worked. This is how Apple II developers knew it worked and wrote their software to, to get around. And so that's how the emulator has to do it. Disk drive is still not working, um, mostly because of the darn magnets. The way that it works is that um, what gets sent to the disk drive is uh, turn on this magnet, turn off this magnet, you know, wait this number of milliseconds and turn on this magnet, and that's actually what drives the, the, the stepper motor. And I've got to reverse engineer that and try to work out how on earth from magnet timings do I work out where on the drive the, the head is. So in short, was as brilliant is, is my curse. Um, this is all open source under an MIT license. You can get it on GitHub, JTAB, Apple Pie, and uh, let me spend a couple of minutes into my question time to actually uh, do a demo. So I just need to, it does have one property that um, when it'll first come up blue when I switch screens, but for now, everyone listen out for the beep because you know what's involved in getting this beep now. There you go. <laughs> uh, so I, I apologize, I can't see this at all, so, which is gonna be interesting. Um, but I, I don't know why it's blue, it seems a offset, uh, a property of the projector. But anyway, so this is emulating an Apple II, it's using a real Apple II plus ROM. You know we can do stuff like for i equals one to 10, print eat your heart, out, Davies. <laughs> Next, run. Um, we can. Uh, thank you. Let me let me show you some some high res graphics. If we set, uh, oops, each color equals two. Um, four y equals one to fifty. H plot, one Y, two, a hundred Y. Next. So there's an example. If I actually, um, well, let me, let me, if I switch to say H color equals six, can you guys see, you can see that okay? Um, if I change that to six and do something like H plot, zero, zero, to 150, You'll see, I hope, I, let me actually, let, let me run another, hang on a sec, let me, let me run this again and do it a different color. Uh, what did I do? I done H color six, right? Let me do H color five. H, oops, hang on a sec. Run. You saw the Venetian blind effect there just when it cleared it. Um, H color equals five, H plot zero, zero to 150. If I zoom in on this, you'll see some of the artifacts. I just drew an orange line, uh, and it's, you know. So anyway, there we go. I think we're probably out of time. Um, maybe, I don't know if we've got a minute or two for questions. Uh, unfortunately, we uh, are pretty much at the end of our time. So if you have questions for James, I would say uh, let's try to get them off to the side and then maybe move yep. to an open space after that. Sure. All right, big round of applause for James. Thank you.